Hey y'all, welcome and welcome back to my channel. It's me, Kia Simone, and let's get into these first two episodes of Real Housewives of Potomac. They got it going on. It's going to be quite the messy season and I'm here for it. Let's just get into it. Before we do, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. Of course, I got to shout out my super thanks. Thank you so much to Tech Mama and Amber Lede. Thank y'all. So of course, episode one starts with them refreshing us about the lies that Juan told Robin that Robin came and told us. She ran around with this bullshit story about why Juan was down to the hotel paying for a hotel room for a woman who he claims was there to see a whole nother athlete. Well, Robin is at home putting together the pictures from their wedding and Juan comes in looking as unhappy as usual. Now, the girl at the hotel is the drama that we knew of. Apparently, after all that came out, Robin had embarrassed herself all over the damn Watch What Happens Live. Robin and Giselle do an episode of their podcast where they have to address this issue and after the whole debacle with this random woman from Canada in a hotel here to see another athlete that you just came and charitably paid for the room this fool had the nerve to be seen in the laundromat and the nail salon with some woman that he worked with at the job he done got his ass fired from it's just too many problems on too many levels you mean to, you ain't got no coos no morals no respect and no damn job so of course they have to have an uncomfortable conversation in our face about this bullshit so Juan comes in the house to Robin framing these pictures from their wedding and they sit down to talk. And first of all, the conversation is so disjointed. You can tell these people don't like each other. You can tell they are not on the same wavelength frequency. They're barely in the same house. Robin starts the conversation off by bringing up the whole girl from Canada thing. Juan cut that short. Juan said, yeah, I did that. That was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. Robin said, yeah, we chose to move past it. We're moving forward. We got married. But I didn't expect the firestorm that came from it when we addressed it on our podcast. What the hell did you expect? That the world was just going to throw their brains away with you? And all Juan had to offer her was, I told you not to do that. She just, uh-uh. You go out in the street and embarrass me. You leave it to me to clean up the mess of embarrassment that you made for me. And then you sit your smug ass back and say, well, I told you to leave it alone. Shit, I mean, the embarrassment will go away after a while. Juan said it was just me being nice. I mean, I had randomly given $20 and $50 to a random homeless person. You ain't never randomly bought them a hotel room. So Juan reiterates this for her story about the lady was here to see a guy who plays for the Ravens. She didn't have her card. She reached out to me. I took care of it. I mean, I know it doesn't make sense, but it's the truth. Robin said, I know, you know, but the question I do have is, if you were down there, you were at the hotel already, you know, with a beautiful woman, why not? Why not go through with it? Juan sat there and looked at the damn girl for a second and finally said, I mean, did you see her? Say what now? Robin said, I mean, not in person, but you've seen her. He said, no, I didn't do anything. You know what Robin wanted to hear in that moment? Robin wanted him to say, because I love you. I don't want any woman but you. That ain't gonna happen, baby. He's never gonna play along with you. It's his narrative or no narrative. And that's why she is so desperate to project the narrative he's selling to her. Juan said, it's all me though. I fucked up. Robin said, yeah, you did fuck up. You shouldn't have gone down there. You shouldn't have been there. This man said, but I'm just too nice. I, I'm, I'm just too nice. You're not even nice to your wife. What are you talking about? Robin said, well, you know, it's been a year to a year and a half since all this happened. And what bothers her now is that the other ladies on the show have the nerve to feel a way about her choosing to not share this when they were planning their wedding. But you would knee deep in every damn body else business. Robin said, you know, they think our relationship is fake or that we have some sort of an arrangement. That would actually be more palatable. That would be more profitable. That would make more sense. That would be less painful to watch. If y'all were to just come out and say, we have an unconventional marriage. At that point, it will go from, girl, is you crazy? To, ooh, y'all crazy. Robin said, and of course, they don't believe your story about the girl from Canada. He said, I mean, I know they don't believe it. I know it doesn't sound like it makes sense, but it's true. Robin said, I know it sounds crazy, but I chose to believe it. Yeah, that's the right word. You chose to believe that bullshit. I chose to believe it because Juan wouldn't make up something that stupid. Yes the hell he would. When a man doesn't respect you, and he has demonstrated that in every possible way, he will start to play in your face. I'ma tell her any damn thing because I can tell her any damn thing. I'ma just start saying wild shit just to prove how much I can get away with. 
Robin said, well, yeah, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people who heard the story about the Canada girl feel like you lied to me. Juan said, well, I mean, I, I don't know. She said, I guess the whole thing was exacerbated by you being in the laundromat with this woman. He said, working, here we go with the bullshit. So here Robin goes telling us another story about they don't know that you had already called me that morning and said, I'm going to the laundromat with coach so-and-so. Child, whatever helps you sleep at night and walk past a mirror, I don't give a damn. He said, maybe whoever it was saw me and this beautiful woman at the laundromat and they don't realize that men and women work together all the time. I mean, they saw us at the nail salon and it's not that big a deal. I, I ain't never been to the laundromat or a damn nail salon with a co-worker. Why you don't go to the nail salon with your wife? Juan said, people just don't know the relationship, Rob. I said, what in the homeboy hell is this, Rob? And he goes on to say, I mean, and Coach Bree is a beautiful, attractive woman, so. Robin said, yeah, I mean, she almost looks like me. He said, yeah, she's beautiful. She's an attractive woman. This man don't like you to the degree that he will sit in your face and sing the praises of another woman while completely overlooking you like you his damn homeboy he confiding in. Now, I could be wrong, but I can't recall ever actually hearing one say anything of that sort to Robin. So Robin goes to address the third elephant in the room. They might as well be in a damn zoo at this point. She said, and then on top of all that, you lost your job, which is devastating. He said, no, it ain't really devastating. I got you to live off now. Juan said, I mean, it's hard because I loved my job. I was passionate about my job, but they say we didn't win enough basketball games, but we also had some key injuries. One of the key injuries might've been your distraction. Here goes Robin cleaning up the bullshit once again. She said, I know that. I just hate that the public thinks that you got fired for a different reason. Robin said, and then you have people rejoicing because you lost your job. Juan said, because they're miserable. No, it's because you were named in a lawsuit for failure to report misconduct between an assistant coach and a student. And based on how you presented yourself on this show, season over season, that sh is believable. Juan said at the end of the day, it comes down to people wanting clicks and views. If you don't go to clicks and views, hell, there are a thousand better things to get clicks and views from than you. So we move on. We see Karen, Candace, and Wendy getting together to catch up. Candace is coming back from being on her tour. Karen is taking a break from her grand dame duties to entertain these heifers. Now, Wendy gets there a little bit after them. Now, when she comes in, they've already ordered drinks. And she said, now, would I be a Debbie Downer if I just ordered water? Candace said, hell yeah, so go ahead and get a drink menu. So she goes to order a drink and she was explaining that she had given up alcohol for Lent. Well, Wendy reached down in her purse and pulled out her rosary. She said, this is why I'm always protected. She said, that's why they come for me, but things always bounce back off because I'm protected. Now they, they froze the screen because they, they want you to remember that it's going to be some bullshit coming later on. So the ladies are sitting down catching up over their drinks and they're talking about the last time that they saw each other, which was at the reunion. Well, they're asking where each of them stands in the friend group with the other ladies. Karen said, you know, she's pretty good with everybody, but Robin, Robin got some ownership to take because Robin hid behind accusations against Karen's marriage, Candace's marriage, and Wendy's marriage. Candace said what blew my wig back was when she sat her ass up there with Andy and told Andy that she didn't tell her own business because she was waiting on Karen to tell it. I'd ask her, but were you waiting on Karen to collect your check too? Karen said, yeah, as a matter of fact, she spent a whole year saying how people were going to see my true self and see me for who I truly am. And the only liar in the mix was her. Well, in the confessional, the producers put their hypocrisy to the test and they asked Wendy, they said, well, well, would you say that you have been forthcoming and told the truth about everything that's been going on in your life over these years? She said, yes, yes, I have. So they asked Karen. Karen said, I'm an open book. Robin is a bald-faced lie. Well, they came to the conclusion that this is clearly a projection and deflection from what Robin had going on in her life. Karen said she might as well just say they have an arrangement. Wendy said, yeah, she clearly don't give a damn about him cheating on her. Karen said, because her ass is delusional. And Candace asked, are they even married? I just well, damn. So we move on and we go to Ashley's new house where she has moved in with her children and without Michael. She says she loves her new home. She has decorated with a seaside chic theme. And she asked her oldest son, Dean, do you love your new house? And he said, yeah. And she asked, well, what's the thing you love the most about your new house? He said, playing with my brother. 
And that just goes to prove that when it comes to children, love matters far more than location. Now, it's not to say that you don't try to or want to provide the best possible home and environment you can for your children, but those kids don't give a damn about no square footage. Is this our happy place? Now, Ashley is in the damn confessional about how, you know, it's different not having Michael there because it's all on her. She's taking care of the kids by herself. She's paying the bills by herself. They panned over to her damn nanny. Ma'am, just Michael ain't been there when you live with him. So what's the difference? And on top of her having the nanny in the house to help with the kids, she also still has Michael on the mortgage in case she need help with the payment. I know Ashley wants to give the strong, independent woman vibe, but ma'am, this is kept a strange wife living the soft life. That's what this is. So Ashley gets her kids fed and she goes outside to call Giselle. So they're FaceTiming and catching up about what's been going on with them. Giselle's oldest daughter is getting ready to go to college. She told Ashley, so that means I'll be moving in with you. Ashley said, yeah, I do need some help with these kids. Come on. Giselle says, speaking of needing help with the kids, uh, somebody told me you were in the Bahamas with Michael. Ashley said, how the hell you know that? Yeah, you ain't got as many secrets as you think. Giselle said it got DM to me now. Tell me what's going on. Ashley said, yeah, we did go to the Bahamas and we went as co-parents, as friends. Uh, okay, girl. Giselle said, well, are y'all divorced yet? Well, no, because we still have some things we need to hash out, you know, about custody and all of those things, girl. Giselle said, well, he did at least kick in financially, right? She said, yeah, I mean, he put the down payment on this house. He's giving me child support, so it's not like he's leaving me high and dry. I don't think he's leaving your ass at all, but go ahead. And Ashley admitted in the confessional that she is kind of dragging her feet with her divorce because it's hard. No, paying them bills by yourself is hard. That's what you worry about. Well, Giselle changed the subject and told Ashley she was going to have a little gathering at her house. She was going to invite Ashley, Sharice, and Robin. And the whole point of this gathering is to basically have an intervention for Robin. And in the confessional, Giselle said, you know, people don't make it to the other side of what Robin is dealing with. Like, people cannot handle that. People can't handle what Robin is going through. And so, of course, I'm concerned about her mental health. Oh, now that it's your partner in crime, you concerned about people's mental health? Because you ain't never gave a damn. Ashley asked Giselle, so what does Robin say when you ask her about, like, the situation with Juan in the nail salon? This lady said Robin told her that Juan is just a nice person and he feels sorry for people all the time. So he befriends them. Ashley busted out laughing and Giselle said, I don't know what's wrong, but her perspective is totally different from everybody else's and I just wanted to know she looked crazy. Yes, please go help your damn friend. So we move on to Giselle's house where she's living out the cougar and the cub. She got some young man there that's supposed to be her boyfriend. It's giving acting and awkward. Even when Giselle tried to bend over with her stiff ass, don't look at my ass. Don't look. He, I'm not looking. What the fuck? Ain't your man supposed to flip it, dip it, and rub it down? Like, I don't understand. I mean, that's your man, right? Even when Giselle called herself dancing, you want me to stop dancing? And he, no, never. And she's trying to touch his show. It's so awkward. It gives so uncomfortable. It gives we're just filming a scene. Giselle is in the confessional trying to tell us a story about a hot sex. Like, girl, please play with somebody else. So they're making sushi, and he's talking about how I haven't seen you in weeks. And she's, yeah, you know, it's weird. I'm just like, you know, I need to see you. And I haven't even gotten into the Giselle naggy mode yet. Well, I need to see you. He said, do you even get like that? No, not really. That's not my thing. I mean, I don't normally do that, but I can. But you won't because this is a damn job. This is y'all playing in our face. But aside from the story they're trying to sell us of her having this boyfriend that's 16 years her junior, she is in real life dealing with her oldest child getting ready to go to college. She says she's sad about that, but she's happy for her daughter. So to celebrate her last spring break, they went to Dubai. They had a great trip. Giselle also explains that the girls have met this boyfriend of hers, that apparently the way they met is he came to the taping of her podcast the girls noticed him looking at her and following her around and started asking her who that is. And she said, oh, that's just my friend. And she introduced them. And the daughter was like, yeah, you can't play us. You can't get nothing past us. And I'm trying to figure out why would you? Why would you have them in the same building at the same event and then want to avoid introducing them? So we move on to Mia and Gordon's house where they are dealing with the Great Divide. They have moved from their 11,000 square foot rental home into a 1,500 square foot rental home. She says she has moved essentially into the closet that she had in that house and it's been quite the adjustment. She said with all of the changes in their business, they're no longer able to afford $10,000 a month. So Mia asked Gordon, are you feeling okay now that, you know, 
know, stuff is kind of settled and we got through a lot of the bullshit. He said, I think it's going to become a court case because I'm not willing to leave behind half a million dollars, which is what I had in the business. Mia explained that Gordon was voted out of the company business by his brothers and she also no longer has her six-figure salary as the marketing director. Big child. Mia said, of course, this has put a financial strain on their household, so they need to figure out how to make that income back. But she is definitely going to find out how to get it back and get it better. Well, G, time's up. I think she about to trade your ass in. So Gordon says to Mia, you know, I think we should pat ourselves on the back because we pivoted pretty quickly. You know, once we got through the whole, woe is me, what did I do? Did I do anything wrong phase? Mia said... Honey, you went through a whole depression. Girl, the whole financial rug was ripped from under y'all. Y'all had to leave y'all's house. He's been dragged out of his business and had to take you with him. You, you think depression is offensive? She said you sat on that couch for two or three months and, you know, seeing you like that was really, really hard for me. He said, yeah, and I appreciate you for sticking with me through it. She said, yeah. Because it was hard. In other words, it was real hard to not leave you right then and there. And the only reason I didn't leave you right then and there is because your ex was sitting up here depressed. And I didn't feel like them dragging my name. So I had to kind of go through the motions with you. But that shit was hard. I don't, don't do that bullshit again. Gordon said, yeah. And then you would turn around and curse my ass out. She said, yeah, I was just getting ready to say, you know, I would start cursing you out and telling you to get up off your ass. Gordon said, because you thought I had done something wrong to tell the truth. She said, no, no, I, I just didn't know, girl. Gordon said, but at the end of the day, they had the attorney and accountant do an audit and everything came back clean, so he didn't do anything. So Mia randomly brings up to Gordon that, you know, I've had to make some lifestyle changes to make sure that, you know, I stay a certain way. And so what do you think about me not drinking? Gordon said, I didn't know you weren't. Mia said, but you do know, because I did tell you. Remember we went to the beach and you asked me if I wanted a cocktail and I told you no? He said, yeah, I do remember that. You said you didn't want a cocktail, but you would take a glass of wine, which is still drinking. Mia said, okay, so yes, I'm drinking wine. So Gordon asked her, well, why did you give up the alcohol? And she said, you know, because the last time that I drank, he said, yeah, things got kind of rocky between you and Karen. She said, well, I feel like I'm a little more filtered when I'm not drinking. She said, but I do think I should probably call Karen. I just don't know what I should say. Sorry for calling you a Mia works my damn nerves. So we move on to Candace and Chris. They're catching up about Candace returning from tour and as soon as she's returned she's trying to get back out there now the issue is it's gonna cost them some money she said she spent well over six figures to go on tour for the last three months and it's gonna cost her some more money to go back out there because she wants to go bigger and better well chris suggested making some cuts do you really need a band do you need backup dancers candace says she is no alanis morissette no jewel and no michelle and dick cello i don't have no acoustic set where i can sit up there and just strum my guitar and sing that ain't how i get down so chris changed the subject and asked candace how was her visit with Candace and Wendy? She rehashed the conversation that they had about Robin and her situation and how she was highly offended by the fact that Robin was all over this story about Chris possibly being unfaithful when she knew what the hell was going on in her house. Candace said her issue with Robin really comes in because Robin was smiling in her face and was supportive in her face. And I don't believe these rumors about Chris, but she was not nearly as passionate about defending Chris in other situations. And she said it led her to wonder if Robin was being so supportive as a means to distract from what was going on in her house. So we move on to Mission Rescue Robin at Giselle's house. Giselle has everything set up on her patio. Sharice gets there first, followed by Ashley. Now, Ashley came in talking about how Hotel Giselle is always under construction. She needs to get this fixed because if I fall and bust my ass, it's going to be a problem. In other words, I'm going to sue your ass. So they're going over their plan about how they're going to have this intervention. And Cherie says, so basically we're going to talk to her about our thoughts and feelings as her girlfriend. Giselle said, yes, because the thing is, we've all been in a similar situation, but... I think she has some delusion going on in her situation and, and she gonna need some help. Giselle said, as a matter of fact, when the whole thing came out about Juan being in the nail salon with the woman, I call Robin screaming and yelling and pissed off by why is this man in this nail salon with this woman? And she told me she don't care. Cherie said, but why doesn't she care? Giselle said, she told me something like she numb to it. She just, Ashley said, yeah, because this isn't the first time. This is a repeated thing that she's learned to deal with. Cherie said, I mean, but a lot of people live like that. Giselle said, uh -uh, we too damn old for that. And that's the damn truth. Who wants to waste some of the best years of their life with somebody who clearly don't even like being around you? I don't want to share my space with you. 
But the problem is Robin doesn't see herself in that light yet. Like Robin doesn't see her own time energy presence as sacred. So she doesn't see anything valuable about it. But you, you wouldn't be just all up in my space and in my face just stanking up my damn energy. Ashley said, yeah, you're right. Life is short. Cherie said, yeah, so is it denial? Is it delusion? Like, what is it? Giselle says she's hurt, upset, and needs a support system. She needs somebody to tell her this is some bullshit. The thing is, Robin knows this is some bullshit. But I understand that as a friend, you have to do your due diligence so that it's documented that, listen, remember back when I told you this was some bullshit? Now, I'm going to help you clean this up, but I told you this was some bullshit. So right as they're talking about the girl, Robin pulls up and comes tipping down Giselle's damn obstacle course of a sidewalk. So Robin gets there and Giselle goes to pour her a drink. Giselle said, well, I don't mind making you a drink because surprise, you're the guest of honor. Robin said, well, you, you didn't tell me that. You just told me to come over. Well, you didn't tell us what you knew about your relationship. So just pipe down. So Giselle starts the conversation with the whole, you know, we love you and we support you as it relates to Juan. And this is just an open forum to talk. You can tell all Robin heard was ambush. So she looks at Cherise first and Cherise said, I don't have anything planned to say. So she looked at Ashley and she said, well, do you have anything to say? Ashley took a deep breath and gave her the speech. Ashley said, well, yes, my thing is this. When the whole hotel receipt thing came out, I initially texted you that first night and I said, I know that this is absolutely ludicrous. But then um, details kept coming out and it started to sound a little fishy or in other words, credible. She said, then I started to wonder, you know, was Robin honest with me or is Robin even being honest with herself? Ashley said, and then when the whole nail salon thing came out, I was mad for you because I've been in that position where you have to defend your relationship and it's not cool. We know you know. So Robin stops Ashley and said, well, let me, let me explain something. They all perked up like, yeah, let, let's hear this bullshit. Robin said, first of all, when it comes to the coach that was at the laundromat and the nail salon and all that, she's been on Juan's staff for three years. So that relationship is not new to me. In terms of the laundromat story about them being hugged up, putting clothes in the machine together, that's a straight lie. Somebody just made that up. Although Juan wasn't smart in dealing with the situation with the lady from Canada at the hotel, he's not dumb enough to be out in public being affectionate with another woman. Giselle is looking at her friend like, ain't no damn way you this far out your mind. Ashley said, well, for me, you're talking about two different things because even if you give him a pass for the whole hotel, motel, holiday in bullshit, because that has happened, you would think that he would have more sensitivity to optics. So he wouldn't be in the nail salon with a strange woman to the public knowing that he had just been caught up in this and had you having to defend his name. Robin said, okay, well, he told me I'm going to the nail salon Coach Bree is going to come. I mean, and I told him, well, Juan, you know, the block is hot. And he said, you know, I don't care. What am I supposed to do? Not go with her, not invite her. They said, yeah, that's exactly what his is supposed to do because he created these circumstances and this environment. Giselle said, the problem is he's not considering how this affects you. Robin said, well, what y'all want me to do? Go home and pitch a fit and throw a shoe at him. And why are you going to the salon with Brie? You can't go to the salon with her and I'm supposed to cry and fall out. What y'all want me to do? Not you got more smoke for your girlfriends than for your man. So they're going back and forth about whether Juan is considering her with how he's moving and how how he's moving is a bad look. Robin said, look, I'm not going to tell him he can't have the friends he used to have. He can't do the things he used to do when it was all good just a few months ago. Cherie said, well, here's my thing. In terms of your joy, Robin, are you good? Robin said, no, my joy has been stolen from me. It's been stolen from me by everything piling on because every other day there's a new headline. Giselle said, but Robin, there's one person who's at the center of all of that. Robin said, well, what you want me to do, Giselle? Giselle said, I don't want you to do nothing but live your best life. I don't want you to do nothing but be happy. That's what I want. Robin said, well, here's the thing. The world wants to tear us apart. Girl, the world ain't got you and Juan to think about. And yes, my joy has been stolen, but it's not Juan's fault. Girl, we gonna need a map to get out of this damn delusion. This is too much. They looked at her like she is absolutely nuts. Giselle said, uh, girl, yeah, it kind of is his damn fault. He was at the laundromat. He was at the nail salon. He was at the hotel. This is his damn fault. So now Robin is yelling about, well, just bring it on. Bring it on. I don't give up. Giselle said, 
Listen, you don't have to act like this is not bothering you. The world has come after you as it relates to Juan. Robin, I don't give a You know who Robin is. Robin gives me that she's that person who is in an unhealthy relationship and she will cut her friends off for telling her that this relationship is unhealthy before she'll cut this unhealthy relationship off. Which begs the question for me of what is the driver for her desperation? Like, why do you have such a need to pretend that this is not going on? Like, are you being forced to go along with the narrative? Blink if you need help. Are you scared to be alone? Are you scared you won't find anyone? Like, what is the need to just put your head in the sand? Robin said, I don't give a pile it on. They already stole my joy. Giselle said, well, why are you in the middle of your damn drama and antics? Do you feel like we have your back? Because we do. Robin said, all of this has just been a pile on and it's cruel. Giselle by fell out because yeah, it has been a pile on. It has been cruel. And this is what they're trying to get you to tell Juan's ass. Cherise interjected to say, listen, all that bullshit aside, he does not need to be out with another woman, period. Robin, for some reason in Robin's logic, this this made sense. Robin said, well, if Coach Bree were big and fat and ugly, would you have a problem with it then? Giselle said, I would. Cherie said, uh, yeah, because my ex-husband had some damn boogers. It was some things he stuck his thing in that I never thought he would thing with. And that's, girl, let me too, Jesus. So Cherise breaks down explaining to Robin that when she looks at her situation, it reminds her so much of what she went through with her ex. Cherie says she gave her ex a thousand passes and excuses, even though she knew the truth. She said one day after everything she put up with and everything she had done for this man, he just got up and walked out the door. And that happens. Once a person shows you they don't want to be with you, let them go. Because once they have exhausted themselves with disrespecting you, that's exactly what they're going to do. Get up and walk right on out the door. She said, I just don't want that for you. Robin said, so are you saying that I'm in denial about the whole situation? I mean, she had the nerve to damn near be offended. Cherie said, well, I don't know. I mean, now... When you go back to the hotel situation, yeah, I kind of get that vibe. Ashley said, well, listen, you know, I can relate because I've been in the situation where Michael got caught in the hotel and I was in that barn with y'all and I was making all them excuses for why he was on the internet in his roles. She said, I blame myself. I said it was because I was going through postpartum and I wasn't showing him affection and all kinds of stuff. But eventually I just got fed up. And she said, you know, now I'm not saying me and you are the same person, but knowing you as many years as I've known you, I just don't feel like you're happy. Robin said, well, what do you mean? Ashley said, I mean, this feels like it's a protect Juan campaign. And it absolutely is. Robin said, listen, the story about the girl from Canada, like if Juan was going to make up a story, he wouldn't make up a story that crazy he would make up a better story they looking at her like girl you are drowning in denial that's some bullshit Giselle said but Robin he was still communicating with the woman Robin said yeah I mean and he, he shouldn't have been and and so I mean okay Cherie said okay so you making him accountable for that we dealt with it okay Robin said I mean we even argued about it I yelled at him I told him to leave and get the f out Giselle said, okay, but hold on, let me ask you because I'm trying to figure out if this happened in reality or in your damn head. When you told him to get the f out, did he actually leave? Robin said, I mean, no, it was just one of those things where, you know, I was saying it, but he didn't go anywhere. So you said in your head, okay. Giselle said, but would you ever put him out? Like say there were another incident, if there were another hotel receipt, would you put him out? Robin said, yes, I mean... Yes, that would be it. Hell no, you wouldn't. I don't know if it's that Robin has been with Juan since they were kids and she doesn't think she'll be able to get anybody else, but she has this severe need to turn a blind eye to everything. Giselle said, well, honestly, I don't think that there's anything that would make you get to the point of actually putting him out. She said, because some women are just like that. Some women choose to turn a blind eye because they want to make it work at all costs. She said, you want it to work, so you put up with a lot of shit. Ashley said, especially the second time around. Yeah, because you got something to prove. Now nah, I got to prove I ain't a damn fool for taking you back. Giselle said, but in all of that, you lose yourself. Giselle said, well, you know my story. You know what I've been through in terms of Jamal and infant fidelity and I'm at a place in my life where I'm much more mature. I'm a fully grown woman now and I'm at a place where I put myself first no matter what, especially ahead of any man. There is no man that comes before me in my life because I spent so many years not putting me first. She said, I just don't want you 
to lose yourself. Giselle said, I remember when y'all got divorced and I remember the woman that you were then and you're just a different woman now. Like, I don't think Robin realizes how much holding on to a dead relationship sucks the life out of you. Giselle said the confessional, I think Juan makes up these wild, crazy stories so that Robin will say, well, that's just so crazy. It's gotta be true. And she believes anything that Juan tells her. Giselle said, but I don't. Sharice told Robin, well, you seem a little defensive right now. She said, no, it's not that I'm defensive. It's that I'm not saying what y'all want to hear. Giselle said, well, what you think we want to hear? Robin said, Juan. Cherise said, oh no, of course that's not what we want. Giselle said, I ain't got no damn problem with that. A good Juan would suit me just fine right by now because it's a Juan kind of moment. Robin said, well, we missed the moment because it was three weeks ago. So what you want from me? You want me to still be mad? Giselle said, what do you want to do? I want to keep living and get through this. Well, just go ahead. Live in your damn delusion. I don't give a damn. Now, Giselle and them are her actual friends. So they said, listen, we just want you to know that no matter what, you have friends who are here for you. We are supportive of you. If you need us, please come find us. Episode one came to a close with Giselle and the confessional saying, listen, I've been round robbing a long time and I'm gonna let her go ahead and be in her denial, but I got a feeling and after a while, it's going to bubble up and bubble over. So we move on to episode two. And episode two opens up with Ashley meeting her mom at a plant nursery where they're shopping for plants for her upcoming housewarming. They're going over the guest list for Ashley's housewarming. And the one guest that will not be there is her mama because her mama has to work. She said, you always planning stuff when I can't be there. Yeah, that, that might be on purpose. Well, she's going over her guest list with her mother. And that's how we get introduced to NECA who's going to be the new housewife on the show. She is a Nigerian attorney who is married to a Nigerian doctor. Child, he got all kind of chicks coming in the house. So Ashley Mama asked, well, is Michael coming to your housewarming? She said, no. I mean, I know that we just went to the Bahamas together, but we were there more as friends and co-parents. And, and y'all ain't friends and co-parents at the housewarming party. Or is it that cameras will be at the housewarming party? And you know, y'all got to keep up this charade. Ashley Mama just was damn silly. She said, yeah, because when you FaceTime me from the Bahamas and he said, hi, Sheila, I just... Why is she standing there looking like SpongeBob? If you don't... Ashley said, actually, mom, he didn't try anything sexual at all. I mean, it's the most respectful we've been to each other in a long time. You sound disappointed. Her mama said, well, let me ask you this because I've been waiting to ask this. I've been, I've been trying to hold out, but I can't hold it no more because that's what your mama do get knee deep in your business. She said, so uh, that whole thing with the lawsuit between uh, Candace and Ashley, you, you want to talk about that? Ashley mama so damn shifty and shady. She is hilarious to me. She don't even mean to be. Ashley said, well, I don't know nothing to tell you. We didn't talk about it. I don't know nothing about it. Her mom said, well, do you think he's going to move forward? With, with the lawsuit? She said, yes, I do think he is. Well, how do you know so damn much if y'all ain't talking? She said, you know, I think his business was actually really affected by it. Ashley is telling her mom, you know, you can't just go around saying all kinds of things about people like that. And she's in the confessional about, I know nothing about this whole lawsuit between Candace and Michael. I'm learning everything. I'm learning about it just like everybody else on the internet. So I don't know anything. Michael's not telling me anything. It's not my fish to fry. Girl, you's a damn lie. Her mama says, so that mean old Candy Cane ain't coming to your party? She said, no, no, she's not. She said, now be nice and invite the girl. Just send her an invitation. She said, mama, ain't that much sage in the world. So we move on and we see Karen and Mia getting together. They're going to get together and hash out their differences since Mia was lying all over Karen's name last season. So Karen and Mia go on a walk and a talk and Karen is telling Mia that, you know, she was shocked and appalled by her behavior last season because she had been nothing but a friend to Mia. Karen said, I never stabbed you in your back, but you were running around saying all kinds of stuff about me that was nothing but lies. Mia said, well, what was I saying, Karen? Karen said, you know what you said about me. I'm not even about to repeat that bullshit. Mia said, no, 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 let's clear it up. No, let's clear it up. Karen said, you lied when you brought that rumor back about me supposedly sleeping with some friend of a friend of yours. Mia said it wasn't a lie. It was something they told me. Jack S. Just because you decided to believe the bullshit doesn't make it not a lie. Karen said, let's just talk girl code. When we are married women, you don't run around saying that kind of bullshit. You don't do that. Karen said, but being that we out here talking, I, I would say that there's hope for us to move forward, but we gonna need to set some boundaries. Mainly, don't be out there lying on me. Karen said, cause when you do that, you start coming after what I call my institution. Here we go. You know, Karen don't play by Ray. And she said, now, you know, I would never spread rumors about you and Gordon. And speaking of you and Gordon, 
How y'all doing? Me and the girl, we fine. I mean, you know, Gordon been going through it. I mean, well, we both been going through it. I've been going through it too. Karen, so I'm gonna just ask you because I don't like rumors. Giselle has said something about there was possible embezzlement going on and that's why Gordon had got snatched up out of his job. She said, but that's bullshit, right? Mia said, yes, that absolutely is bullshit. But to Giselle's defense, when everything first hit the fan, that's what I thought too. Karen said, you thought your damn husband embezzled money? She said, I didn't know what to think, shit. She said, but she's in a better place than she was a year ago. She said, she's not drinking anymore outside of wine. She said, that's because you can get wine at the grocery store, so it must be nutritional. What in the thought mania thought process is you talking about? So Mia's explaining to Karen that one of the reasons she gave up hard liquor is because she feels like it's mind and mood altering. And she feels Feels like it had something to do with her throwing that drink at Wendy in Miami. Now we gonna get the drunk I need rehab bit. I just cut the shit. She said and really I shouldn't have been drinking because I was on medication. Here Karen go with her bullshit about oh my god that is so oh my god it's so responsible and strong of you to admit that because everybody can't admit that. Girl just play with somebody else. Well they've hashed out their differences and now they think they're more mature than the rest of the group. Karen's talking about you know I just wish that the other girls could do what we're doing. What being frenemies? They are. So so we move on to Candace's house where she is meeting with her manager after her tour. He comes over to her house and she gives him a tour of her office. He said, this is ghetto. She got folding chairs, a picnic table. It is, it is quite ghetto because in the ghetto we are resourceful and fabulous. Candace is apparently coming out of her contract with her record label and trying to plan the next leg of her tour. And her manager suggested bringing Drew Sedora from Real Housewives of Atlanta to be a guest performer at one of her shows. Candace just looked at him and said that that's the only option you got. Candace said at this point, she ain't really interested in a bunch of collaboration. She says she can get tickets sold and S's in the seats on her own. And that's what she gonna do. So we move on to Robin and Juan's house. She's in the kitchen bagging up a bunch of damn vitamins and shit. I hope that's what she doing. Juan comes bopping in like he give a damn about what you're doing. Trying to distract herself from the pain of you. She told him she's trying to gather all her supplements to fix all the deficiencies that her nutritionist told her about. She said, I know you don't give a damn about women's business, but since you are the topic of women's business, I thought I'd let you know what the women's been saying about you. So she tells Juan how she went to Giselle's house and she was ambushed with this intervention and how they're all concerned about everything that's going on between me and you. Juan said, didn't we have conversations about all this stuff prior? Robin said, yeah, and that's what I'm trying to get them to understand. Just because it's news to them doesn't mean it's news to me. Robin said, I guess their thing was in light of the whole hotel situation, why would you go to the nail salon and put yourself in a position to be photographed again? This man said, I don't care. I so I guess he said it louder for the ones in the back. If you ever had any doubt about whether he gave a damn, let it be cleared. He said, what am I supposed to do? Not live my life? I mean, my circle is tight. Robin said, I know. And she's trying to make it about me and about how that makes me look. And I'm telling her, I don't care how it makes me look. I don't know if Robin is a glutton for punishment or if she is a martyr for pick me. This is some wild shit. Robin said she wants me to be mad and Juan said, well, go ahead. Just go ahead and get mad. Just get mad and curse me out. Go ahead. Listen, don't threaten me with a good time. So he's steady mocking her about get mad, throw some stuff, break some glasses. Go ahead and get mad. I, I need you to get mad. She said, no, you don't. She just giggling like this shit is cute. Juan said as far as he's concerned, everybody got issues and everybody handles their stuff differently. Well, just live your life. Robin said in the confessional, she don't give a damn what these ladies think about what's going on between her and Juan. They can have a field day talking about it. And once they had a full conversation about throwing her feelings to the wayside, she changed the subject to addressing his damn feelings about, well, I just wanted to check in, you know, since the whole losing your job and see how you've been feeling. He said he's not really worried. He's working through things. He's going to take his time and trust the process. He said it's just that at my former job, we did everything at a high level and we have this very unfortunate lawsuit going on. She said in regard to this lawsuit, not only did Juan not do anything wrong, he did everything right and everything in his power. Oh, oh, all right. So Robin's in the kitchen about, yeah, it'll be a blessing when this whole lawsuit is over. And he's just carrying on about, yeah, because I love my guys. I just love my guys. All I do is love my guys. 
five. And Robin's standing there looking like, I wish he would say that about me. He said, but I know everything is gonna work out because I looked out for the best interest of everyone involved and I always put other people ahead of me. I was just, what? Robin said, yeah, me too. Just So we move on and we meet the newest addition to the show. We meet NECA and her new husband. They've been married about a year. They have a new house that is under construction and they are going to check on the progress. NECA used this introduction to let us know that this house is one of many. She is a child of generational wealth and she didn't know that that was a problem until she was delayed from closing on this house. And that was because she had a whole bunch of unreported properties. She said she had two lakefront properties in Wisconsin, a property in Florida, Maryland, Georgia, and possibly properties in Nigeria, but she ain't quite sure about those. And her husband ain't too shabby either. He is a doctor by day, a scrub model by afternoon, and a nightclub owner by night. Well, y'all better be getting the money. Now, apparently she and her husband are on a fertility journey and we gonna have to hear all kinds of invasive questions and information. I don't wanna know if that man had his damn hands in his pants. So we move on and we see Wendy visiting a space that she's checking out to possibly host a talk show. Her plan is to develop a talk show that crosses political with ratchet. Well, you get that. What the fixation with ratchet is, is beyond me. I don't know why, like why are you working to be ratchet. So Wendy's in the confessional talking about how she's a multi-hyphenate. She has all these jobs and positions. And you know, I'm sorry if you can't do all those things, I can. So as soon as we hear Wendy sitting in the confessional talking all this shit, they cut back to her back at the studio that she's checking out with the show producer. Well, they're sitting down to talk about the possible budget for producing this talk show. Wendy said in the confessional that the big goal is for her show to get picked up by a major network. She would love for her show to be on Bravo or E! or MSNBC, Netflix or HBO, but the budget is giving to be. So the producer is going over different things you'll need in terms of, first of all, the cost of this actual studio. She's talking about getting a PA. Wendy said, yeah, I think I know a good one of those. But um, what's the PA again? See, this is my damn problem with Wendy. She just say anything out of her mouth. Why would you sit up there and say some bullshit? But yeah, I know a good one. I can get me a good one. Now, what is it again? The lady told it's a damn production assistant, girl. Wendy said, well, in terms of budget, I know you always get on me because I haven't given you a budget. She said, well, can you give me one now? Wendy said, no, no, I can't. She said, what I can tell you is between pre-production costs and the cost of the studio rental, we're already over budget. Her girlfriend looked at her and said, uh, that's not a lot. The hell you trying to produce? Wendy said, well, my budget shouldn't have to be an Oprah budget. Well, why don't you do it out your damn house? Why are you trying to rent a studio and get your Oprah on if you ain't got no damn Oprah budget? Don't you do CNN and shit from your house? Well, Wendy found a reason to disqualify this place. She said, I hear a lawnmower outside. Does this place soundproof? Hell no, it ain't soundproof. There's somebody damn apartment, they airbnb it. She said, oh, okay, well, there's soundproof studios out there. I think I'll keep looking. So now they're discussing names for the show. Wendy want to call it Zen Win or Wendy's Wisdom. That lady told her, hell no, we just stop playing with me. Wendy said, okay, well, what about wine with Dr. Wendy? <laughs> And every episode, I'll have a glass of wine. And I mean, go ahead, but that ain't that original. I'm just... So we move on and we see Karen has called the ladies together for a Pilates session. She said she is getting ready for the triple 20, which is her damn 60th birthday. She's trying to get in the best shape possible. So Mia, Giselle, and Ashley come and meet her down at the Pilates studio. So Karen's telling the ladies that with her 60th birthday coming up, she went and got a full panel of tests done. She got MRIs, EKGs, check my heart, all kind of shit. She said, you know, I get choked up every time I have to say it, but they said I have a 5% calcium deposit in my carotid artery. You don't sit your 5% ass down. So they get through their workout and Mia said, well, let me go to the bathroom because I went to the bathroom all damn day. Well, while Mia is off at the bathroom, Giselle said, well, this is the perfect opportunity to ask you, Karen. Um, You and Mia good, because why is she here? Karen said, we got together at the park and we hashed it out and we decided we're gonna work our way to a better friendship. Karen said, one boundary we did establish is let's not bring rumors, let's only bring facts. Giselle said, well, on that note, I got something I wanna ask you. Giselle said, my concern as Robin's friend is Robin and she has come under fire from the world for all this stuff about Juan. So my question to you is, do you plan to apologize to her? Karen said, for what? Cause I ain't the damn world. Giselle said, just recently you accused him of having some blonde woman in Georgetown. Well, didn't he pop up 
in a laundromat in a nail salon with a woman that Robin said actually looks like her and ain't Robin a blonde haired woman? Giselle said that was a rumor. Karen said, yeah, you're right. It was a rumor. And if I go by that, I can give Robin some grace. Giselle said, by grace, do you mean an apology? She said, well, no, not necessarily because I do believe that there was some truth to that. And there was. So Karen is trying to be diplomatic. She said, well, you know, maybe both Robin and I owe each other apologies. Now, how we're going to get those apologies to each other is beyond me because I'll put her and she don't put me. So you gonna have to arrange that, Giselle. Giselle said, that ain't no problem. Just bring your damn apology when I arrange the shit. So Karen changed the subject and she started getting into Ashley's business. She asked Ashley if her divorce has been finalized yet. She said, no. My divorce is not final, but I do live very much alone and separate from Michael. And my name is the only name on the deed to the house. And that's all that matters. So Mia asked Ashley, can you tell us why Michael is suing Candace? Why, why are y'all asking this girl this at every turn? Don't y'all know why he's suing her? Are y'all trying to get just inside notes on what's going on in terms of what his legal strategy is? What, don't y'all know why he's suing her? So they asked about the status of the relationship between Candace and Ashley. Ashley said, well, Candace told me to never talk to her again. And they cut to her in the confessional saying that after the reunion, where Candace had apparently accused Ashley of some stuff that Ashley says she didn't do and says she sent proof she didn't do. In response to texting the proof to Candace, Candace sent her a text back, something along the lines of you proving yourself to be the type of person that will make up lies for entertainment purposes. So don't text me. Plead your case to somebody who give a damn. I, all right. Mia said, well, is she going to be at your housewarming party tomorrow? She said, no, I haven't invited her. And so they cut to when Karen, Wendy, and Candace went out to get drinks and Karen mentioned the housewarming to Candace and Candace said no I don't think I was invited to that well Karen busts Ashley little bubble she said well Candace has an engagement in LA anyway Ashley said well that's all right if she won't be there I got somebody coming in her place anyway y'all are gonna meet the new girl NECA well they asked if Ashley's gonna have a special man she said no mm -mm. like I ain't got time for that bullshit with Michael yeah because y'all are still a damn couple so they brought up Giselle and her cub of a boyfriend about she got this young boyfriend and Mia said, I don't know why you went and robbed that damn cradle. I wouldn't know what to do with somebody that damn young. Giselle said, well, I do. And somehow Karen has worked her way around to she inspired Giselle to be in this relationship with this young man. She said because she just had to go get somebody with a 17 year age difference. But instead of getting somebody 17 years older like I did, she went back when and got somebody 17 years younger. I don't know what in the self-centered math you talking about. But that shit don't add up to me. I don't I don't know how you got that out of that. So we move on and we get to Ashley's housewarming. Her house is beautiful. All the ladies are arriving. Their dresses are beautiful. This season, I just got to say, between the confessional looks and some of the looks in scene, they are slaying. Well, they had the housewoman. Ain't no food even ready yet. Here, Giselle go starting shit. She just digging all in Ashley business. Ashley's talking to her uncle, and she's talking about, you know, when one door closes, another one opens. Giselle said, well, speaking of doors opening and closing, don't you and Michael have some one-hour rule where he has to give you at least an hour notice before he come over here? Just where in thin air hell did you get that from? Well, that prompted Ashley's uncle to get in her business. He said, hey, uh, what you talking about? Y'all been on vacation? Where y'all went on vacation she said to the bahamas giselle said you know i subscribe to the idea that even though we're divorcing we're divorced we can still come together and do things as a family ashley uncle said hold on you you trying to tell me that michael been on vacation with you giselle said yes where have you been at his house minding his damn business like you struggle to do now ashley caught up in her damn lie by well when i had facetimed you from the bahamas i think i had forgot to tell you that michael was there too she said you know he was off taking the kids to the water slide her uncle said oh all right and she's in the confessional but you know my uncle's just an old school dude no your uncle just has common sense and it seemed to have skipped you so we see the ladies arriving. We see Karen followed by Mia who comes in looking as uncomfortable as hell. She's like, she cannot walk in them damn shoes. And I don't know what kind of covers she had on, but you need to get some different ones. They looked like they was trying to jump through her damn shirt. It just all looked uncomfortable. She comes in about, oh my God, cha-ching, this is so nice. Oh, Ashley. And she's in the confessional about, I mean, it's cute. Mia was clearly sent here from hater hell. Well, Sharice is the next one to arrive and she arrives in the same damn outfit Karen got on just in a different color. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, don't tell them I said this, but I think Karen wore it better. So, Ashley takes all the ladies inside to tour the house. And just as she's taking them in for the tour, Wendy arrives. Now, I don't know. It could just be me. Maybe Wendy is dressed for spring, too. But I'm trying to figure out why Wendy is dressed like a rapper's girlfriend. So, they finish the tour and the next person to arrive is Ashley's messy friend from last season, Deborah. Wendy said, well, I didn't know that this was a kid's party. Robin gets there shortly after. And Robin says she came to show her face so that they know she ain't hiding, she ain't avoiding nothing. If you got something to say to me, go ahead and say it. So the new girl, Neca, is the last to arrive. And she comes in and she's meeting and greeting everybody. Production asks Wendy, has she ever met Neca before? She said, well, no, not really, but I've seen her in passing. But Ashley let her know that y'all are both Igbo. I think that's how it's pronounced, child. If I'm saying it wrong, please forgive me. I don't feel like no fights in my comments. So Wendy goes to high five her and then corrected everybody on how they're pronouncing her name because if we from the same place and the same people, I'm going to tell y'all, y'all are saying her name wrong. Well, after their, you know, high fiving and bonding over their culture, Ashley says, Wendy, <laughs> Do you mind if I talk to you? Can I talk to you inside? I hear go some bullshit. Well, they go inside and sit down to talk. And before Ashley can get her shit started, Wendy starts out by trying to compliment Ashley and stroke her ego. She tells her that she's making a beautiful home for her children. Wendy told her, you have always made me feel like I matter. And I hold you in a very special place. But sometimes, Ashley, I have questions about you. Wendy said, for example, the whole Deborah thing that happened last season where Deborah was claiming my my man was trying to smile in her face and all that. Ashley said, yeah, I remember that. Wendy said, exactly. So we could be real cool, but I don't want to feel like the first chance you get, you're going to stab me in the back. Well, you can talk yourself out of believing that if you want to, but that's exactly what's going to happen. Ashley said, well, part of the reason I think you don't realize that I'm trustworthy is because we don't spend enough time together. You know, we don't do things and go out and kiki or have our kids spend time together. Wendy said, but I invited you to my child's birthday party and you didn't come. Ashley said, yeah, uh, that did happen and I wasn't able to make that. That's probably where my invitation stopped. Wendy said, that's exactly where your invitation stopped. You ain't gonna play with my baby. This was a difficult to follow roundabout conversation, but that's typically how it is when Ashley is getting ready to start some shit. Ashley is talking in that snake ass manager voice that she uses about there's so many levels of you that I still want to get to know. And, you know, it makes me feel like you feel guarded around me or the group, especially when it comes to telling us vulnerable things about yourself. Wendy said, well, I don't have a problem being vulnerable. I just want to be sure that when I'm vulnerable, I'm sharing my personal business and to save hands. Ashley said, well, would you prefer that I just not tell you anything? Wendy said, no, I'm not that friend. And this is not about her being the friend who don't want you to never tell them when they man is out in the street doing this, that, and the third. That's Robin. This is about don't come to me with a bunch of bullshit lies that you and your girlfriend done made up. Ashley is trying to find her segue to get to the bullshit she's trying to start. She said, well, in the vein of what we're talking about, you know, since I talked about it with NECA, ain't you just invited this girl to your house and you already in the house starting with her name. She said, you know, we went out for lunch and I was talking to her about you and how esteemed you are and all that. And, you know, I mentioned that you were a doctor and she was saying, uh, well, is that a medical doctor? Ashley said, no, she's a PhD. NECA said, oh, okay, so a doctorate of philosophy. Ashley is sitting there looking like, ooh, you're being shady, a doctorate of philosophy? NECA said, yeah, that's what PhD stands for, doctorate of philosophy. Ashley said, oh, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, I know you didn't know. So Ashley is telling it to Wendy and she was like, well, you know, I didn't know. I thought she was being shady when she said it. Wendy said, no, I have a doctorate of philosophy, which less than 1% of the world has. So Wendy's in the confessional. She done took the damn bait about, I worked hard for my PhD. And if it doesn't make her happy, that's on her. But she's still going to call me Dr. Wendy. This is where I would like you to use all of your education and critical thinking skills. I would like for you, doctor, to stop letting people just come tell you anything and you take off running with the battery in your back. So apparently that wasn't enough to get the shit started. Ashley said, well, also, we had a conversation about something about your family being Osu. And they cut to this conversation of Ashley and Neca at lunch. And Ashley is saying to Neca that there was some headline, some news story about the fact that Wendy's family was exposed as being Osu 
in their Nigerian culture, which is being some form of curse. So Ashley is telling Neka, yeah, so as far as we understand, her family was shunned from their community. Neka said, well, do you know why they were being shunned? Ashley said, as far as we know, it has something to do with them being Osu. Neka said the Osu are a group of people who are offered up to this native or local king. And the people who offer up their children are called Osu, but apparently this practice has been abolished. She said, now, I don't know if Wendy or her family has any sort of affiliation with that. I just know that I don't. So NECA educated this damn fool at lunch. Ashley sat in Wendy's face and said, yeah, she said like the Osu was like really bad, like cursed and stuff. And production asked Ashley in the confessional, why when you went to Wendy, did you present it to her like Nika was talking trash about her? And Ashley said, there, well, yeah, I did, didn't I? Let me tell you what this is giving me and it's gonna come off harsh. So I'm gonna apologize in advance. This is giving me a white presenting woman because Ashley could pass for white if she straighten her and stay out the sun. A white presenting woman who is pitting these two Nigerian women against each other based on their culture. So this is y'all's way of escaping the whole colorism thing. We gonna make it a culture battle between these two Nigerian women. Just Ashley's in the confessional, but it was the tequila. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't have drank. No, it's your soul. It's your character. It's who you are. So Ashley is telling Wendy, well, you know, I had no clue what this Osu was. So Wendy explains that Osu is something from ancient gods. Her family does not practice it. And the Osu are typically outcasts. People don't want to be around you when you're Osu. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you now, the first question that came to my mind is, does that have anything to do with why Eddie's family didn't want him to marry her or don't want nothing to do with her family and he had to give up his entire family to be with her? Wendy's in the confessional talking about NECA saying, you know, you're coming into the group, bringing up false blog articles, and I just would have expected more as would I of you. You're a whole damn doctor and you have a career in political science. I would expect that you would be able to at least get to the root of the information, do some kind of research, verify the source, something. But to take Ashley, of all people, Ashley's word and just run with it, it makes me question your judgment. Episode two came to an end with Wendy saying she would have expected more from NECA, especially being a fellow Nigerian. And that's why you don't need to let this damn girl come to you and tell you what your fellow Nigerian said. But that's it, that's all. And I ain't got no more. Thank you so much for coming down here, listening to me and let me get that off my chest. Child, that was a lot. I'm gonna try to stay on top of this and not have to do these two episodes together because this be dragging me. Please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. And in the meantime, until next time, just like every time, I love you and I mean it. Bye.